we're going to be looking at um, three sections from the book of Revelation on these three evenings. <clears throat> and the final evening will be the very closing chapters of Revelation, a tale of two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. If you're here tomorrow night, we should be looking at um, that notorious chapter 13 in Revelation and the picture it gives us there of demonic power in conflict with the church and mysterious numbers like 666. So if you've always wondered what that meant, you can at least come along and see if I tell you. But tonight we're going to be begin in chapters 4 and 5. And uh, these are passages which take up very much the theme that Jeff has been leading us in worship around, the centrality of Christ, the Ascended Lord. So I'm going to read Revelation chapters 4 and 5 now. Let's hear God's word together. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy 
to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. I shall never forget my first visit to the theatre. It was in London as a schoolboy. Uh, the old Vic used to put on matinee performances for school children of Shakespeare plays. And my English teacher had decided it would do us good to go and see the current one, Macbeth, because that was the school's production. That term, we were putting on Macbeth for the benefit of our parents and others who persuaded to part with half a crown to come and see it. I was fairly young at that time. I didn't have a major part in the play. In fact, I was to be an apparition, conjured up by the three witches. Uh, I had to give Macbeth some rather dubious advice about his political future, I remember. I had no name, uh, Shakespeare simply dubbing my couple of lines as the words of a, quote, bloody child. Perhaps that's why the English master thought that I was a particularly appropriate candidate for reading them. I was all agog to see how the old Vic company would handle such a demanding role as mine clearly was. When the moment I'd been waiting for came, I was was just entranced. They could have been real witches on the stage. Because by some uh, miracle of stagecraft, the old Vic succeeded in producing the most realistic thunder and lightning and the most extraordinary eerie lighting effects haloing the witches, uh, phosphorescent paints, I suppose, and things like that. And when uh, my part appeared, the bloody apparition, uh, I appeared in this halo of colored light, suspended in midair. For all the world, it looked as if this apparition was floating. It was joyously creepy for all the hundreds of schoolchildren there who were ooing and ahhing. And it began for me an interest that lasted actually the rest of my school career, not in acting at all, but in the technical wizardry that goes on behind the scenes. I just longed to find out how they had done it. And eventually, I think I began to have some ideas on that. Ever since those days, in fact, I've rather begrudged, you know, the prominence which the names of actors get at the end of films or on programs when you go to the theatre. I've always rather begrudged that because anybody who really knows is perfectly well aware that the real brains in the outfit aren't there on the stage at all. The real brains are behind the scenes, out of the limelight. Supremely, of course. The real brains are in that canvas chair that is set apart for the director. That's where the real creative genius lies. That's where the lighting and the stage sets and the camera angles and the author's script and the actor's performances are all welded together so that out of these diverse elements, a single artistic work of drama is produced. So it's the director, I think, who really ought to occupy the center of the stage, but he very rarely does, doesn't he? Very rarely. And as a result of that, I think most audiences are not really conscious of the crucial role which that director wields over everything they see. 
Certainly that backstage experience of mine helps me whenever I come to these chapters in Revelation 4 and 5. Because, well, it was the, the bard himself, wasn't it, who said all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Well, there is an element of truth in that, according to the Bible. History is not a chaos of random events, according to the Bible. It's going somewhere. It's a bit like a play. It has an inner coherence. There's a theme. There's a goal. There's a plot. And we are the actors in this drama. Not puppets, you understand. We're not manipulated by hidden strings. We're free to make of our assigned roles what we will. Yet the Bible insists we, we do have a definite part to play. It's that part that gives our lives meaning. It's that that delivers us from the despair of being nothing but absurd accidents in a huge cosmic game of dice. No, the world means something. It's going somewhere and we have a part to play in it. The only problem is this. As the result of a monumental act of carelessness in the very first scene, all the scripts have been lost. None of us know our lines. Few of us have any clear idea of what the plot is. Indeed, there are quite a few who are skeptical there ever was a plot. No, they say history just evolves by its own internal laws. There's no plan. There's no scheme. If the world is a stage and we are players, then it's a farce we're playing in. Well, the Bible is adamant, you see. That sort of attitude is totally mistaken. Of course, it is difficult from our perspective, locked into the play within the flow of events, to pick out the threads which integrate this drama as it draws towards its finale. It's hard for us sometimes to identify those threads, to work out where things are going. But those threads are there. And it was to assure John of that fact that he was given this great vision which constitutes the book of Revelation. See how uh, chapter 4 verse 1 begins. I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. So what we, what we have here is a peep behind the scenes. For a few brief moments, the curtain has been drawn back. The door has been opened to expose what's going on in the wings of history. A window has been opened on all that backstage activity which usually nobody sees or even appreciates. In an ecstasy of prophetic vision, John is conveyed up into the cosmic control room, the hub from which the wheels of history are turned the very center, the operation center of the universe. Now, as with all of the book of Revelation, his description of that experience is heavily loaded with symbolism. It's hard to imagine how it could be otherwise. And we aren't going to have time to discuss in detail the meaning of every little cryptic phrase in this chapter, all the ones we should be looking at tomorrow and the day after. But we will capture the kernel of John's remarkable experience in chapters 4 and 5 if we focus down tonight on three of the most prominent elements in this experience. The lamb, the scroll, and the throne. Or if you want to retain my theatrical analogy, the leading man, the missing script, and the director's chair. Let's begin where John's vision begins, with the director's chair, the throne. 4 verse 2. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Seated on them, 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Now to understand the impact of this scene on John, you've got to remember that the church in his day was going through a very difficult time. These were days of persecution. False teaching was abounding. 
the spiritual zeal of a great many Christians was flagging. John the Apostle himself is in penal exile on the island of Patmos, cut off from the congregations in Asia, which were his pastoral responsibility. Things did not look at all good for the Christians, and inevitably their faith was being tested as a result. It's easy to understand that. After all, Jesus had said that with his arrival, history had embarked on its last act. The kingdom of God has come. That's what he said. But the years were passing, and there was no sign yet of the final curtain. Jesus had also said, hadn't he, that there was a dressing room accommodation backstage waiting to receive faithful actors when they made their last exit. But the Christians were dying now, some of them as martyrs. And their bodies were laying in the tomb like anybody else's. Could we really be so sure about that backstage accommodation? Perhaps most difficult of all, Jesus had said that though the devil was doing his very best to upstage him and steal the show, we didn't need to worry because the author was determined to write the devil out of the script. Yet when these first century Christians looked around, they saw unfettered evil on all sides. Could Jesus' words be relied upon? If anything, the devil and his agents did seem to have successfully stolen the show. Now, of course, it's at times like that that Christians are tempted to doubt God's promises. And it's at times like that that we need more than anything else, therefore, a clear conviction about the throne, that is, the sovereignty of God. That is precisely the purpose of John's initial vision here of the director's chair. On the plane of history, the church may seem utterly helpless before the onslaught, the raging onslaught of hostile, demonic powers determined to exterminate the church. But behind the scene, if only you could see through that door, behind the scenes, calm and unruffled, sits a God who is in full control the situation. There were many Jews and Christians at the uh, end of the first century who were great social pessimists, who believed the world was in the hands of the devil. But there was no point in wishing any good for this world. It was just a lost cause. The only hope they could see was perhaps if God intervened in some dramatic and uh, cataclysmic way to turn history over. It's interesting that John doesn't quite see it that way. Of course he does believe that God is going to intervene in a cataclysmic way. But he also believes that God is on the throne now. He also believes that God is in control of the situation now. God hasn't let go of the reins of the universe and given them over to the devil for a period. He's still there on the throne. That's why John, in some ways, is, is so much like uh, the Old Testament prophets. Think of a man like Isaiah, ministering rather disconsolately before the altar, maybe, the year that good King Uzziah died, wondering maybe what sort of inferior monarch would take Uzziah's place. When suddenly the temple is aflame with light, I saw the Lord, he said, seated on a throne, high and exalted. In that uncertain political situation, Isaiah again sees the king, the real king. Or think of Ezekiel, another great Old Testament prophet, walking demoralized by the river keeper, a priest in exile. God's people now scattered across the Middle East by conquest. And suddenly he's engulfed in a fearful thunderstorm and a fiery chariot appears and one born upon it on a sapphire throne. High above upon the throne was a figure like that of a man, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day was the radiance around him. 
Now, you don't need to be very uh, shrewd to see that uh, John here is echoing, isn't he, those very visions of Isaiah and Ezekiel in the way he's describing this scene. The emerald rainbow and the thunder and the lightning, these are allusions to Ezekiel's experience. That crystal sea also probably corresponds to what Ezekiel calls an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. And those four mysterious creatures that John describes so precisely, if you think about it, they are a fusion of the six-winged seraphim that Isaiah describes surrounding God's throne and those mysterious four-faced cherubim that Ezekiel describes as bearing the throne upon its chariot. So what John is doing here is saying, look, I've seen it too. That vision Isaiah saw in the temple, that vision Ezekiel saw by the river Kiba, God has opened the door of heaven and I've seen the king too. Of course, there are elements which are distinctive to his vision that are a bit more mysterious, not the least those 24 elders. Some people think they're an order of angels. Some people think they are representatives of redeemed humanity. It's difficult to choose between the two. But uh, I don't think you should get too obsessed by the details of John's symbolism in a passage like this. Because what we're in here is the heady atmosphere of doxology and worship. We have failed to understand this chapter if we haven't entered into that. The identity of the 24 elders uh, is, is really a matter of irrelevance. God doesn't intend that we should come away from this chapter with our brows furrowed with perplexity, saying, I wonder what that means. Rather, he tends we should come away wide-eyed and breathless with amazement, exclaiming, wow. In terms of spiritual punctuation, you see, Revelation 4 is an exclamation mark. It's not a question mark. This is the God we have come to worship, you see. Infinitely transcendent. Holy, 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 they say. Just like those seraphim in Isaiah 6. Eternally unchanging, who was and is and is to come. Here is the director. Here is the one who sits in that throne, that director's chair, governing the human drama from his vantage point behind the scenes. John wants his contemporaries to understand that. However events on the stage may seem to deny it, make no mistake about it, he says. It is that purpose, God's purpose, the director's purpose, that shapes the course of history. Why, without that purpose, the universe itself would cease to exist. For he created all things, and by his will, they were created and have their existence. Something that I want you to, to appreciate about this vision in Revelation 4 that goes beyond even the tones of worship that are there, though. For this wasn't just a stimulus to worship for those first century Christians, was it? If you think about it, I think you'll realize this was actually a rather powerful political statement of very great practical relevance to their lives. It's not as if John is saying, look, I want you to forget all about your troubles in the world and withdraw into a pietistic little community where we can sing lots and lots of enthusiastic songs about Jesus his Lord and and forget all our troubles. No, 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 no. That would be a misunderstanding. John is not shy here about making some very, very controversial points. Take, for instance, the way those 24 elders prostrate themselves before the throne in verse 10. Casting their thrones before him. Do you know that in the ancient world... That was precisely the kind of act of political obeisance which was required of men and women when they honored the emperor. Alexander the Great began it. The Seleucid kings after him took it up in Asia Minor. There would be no mistaking John's intention here in his original audience. Or that chorus of worship they chant, Worthy art thou. Do you know, those very words are part of the liturgy of emperor worship which Rome fostered among its colonial subjects. So did you get the point? 
John is here quite deliberately imitating the kind of sycophantic admiration that the self-deified powers that be of his day sought to surround themselves with. If you went to the court in Rome, you would see loads of people standing around. And whenever they were commanded to do so, this was exactly the kind of thing they said, this was exactly the kind of gesture of obeisance they made to honor the emperor. And of course, this was precisely the kind of emperor worship the Christians were being commanded to offer on pain of death. That's why they were being persecuted. That's why they were being martyred. Precisely because they said no. John then is saying to his persecuted Christian comrades here, Stick to it. Don't be intimidated. If only you could see into the wings, if only you could see through that door I saw through, you would realize there is a loftier throne than Caesar's and a worthier king. The course of history doesn't lie in their hands, but in our God's hands. The petty favors which they... Uh, offer to their flatterers are nothing compared to what he has in store for those who love him. This weekend, of course, a great many people are looking back 50 years, aren't they? To graze days of, of great darkness in Europe when the power of evil really was in the ascendant in a most extraordinary and terrifying way. Well, if you want to find a period in modern history which felt anything like these Christians were feeling at the end of the first century, that has to be it. What is John saying into that sort of situation? He's saying you don't have to be frightened of tyrants. You don't have to be frightened of bullets and bombs. We Christians don't have to assassinate dictators. They're not important enough. Let them lock us up if they must. They will not dislodge that fiery brilliance that sits upon the throne, nor will they ever hold the adoration that perpetually surrounds it. We join that angelic host in heaven in defiance of every tyrant, every dictator. And we Christians affirm, worthy art thou, Oh Lord, I do want you to understand what a political statement that is. In tame, tolerant old England, we miss it. We've had democracy so long, we don't value it any longer. And we've certainly forgotten what it was like to face demonic evil in the driving seat. That's why maybe a weekend like this is good for us. Someone was saying to me the other day, could it ever happen again? Well, why not? Why ever not? Do you know how many times down through history people have said it could never happen again? No, we Christians don't just have here an emotional stimulus for our worship. This is not just a, a vision which is designed to take us into our churches and make us feel good and escapist. This is a statement about the reality out there, beyond the walls of our churches. It's a statement about who is really in control. Worthy art thou, our Lord. Oh, but wait a minute. <clears throat> there, there is a hesitation in John's vision, isn't there, when we come to chapter 5? It seems even heaven has its problems. There is a hiccup in the control center. Someone's asking a question, and it doesn't seem to have an immediate answer. From the throne, you see, John's eyes turn 
to the scroll. Look at the beginning of chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Now we can be a bit agnostic about the 24 elders if we want to be, but we can't really make sense of what John is saying here in this chapter without some idea of what this scroll represents. But fortunately, that issue is not in much doubt. In the ancient world, often a last will and testament was a scroll sealed with seals in this way. In fact, the last will and testament of Augustus Caesar, we know, was a scroll sealed with seven seals. So that might very well have been the first thing that came into a, a Roman Christian's mind when they heard about a scroll sealed with seven seals. This is a will. There are other pieces of evidence, too, that help us to understand what this scroll is all about. For one thing, notice what happens in the rest of the book of Revelation as the seals on this scroll are eventually broken. The answer is that things start to happen on the stage of world history. As the seals are broken, history moves towards its climax. The unfolding of God's purpose in the last days of human history begins to happen. What's more, if you uh, look further on into the book, into chapter 13, verse 8, or chapter 17, verse 8, you come across a book of life which has the names of all the redeemed since the creation of the world and which we're told belongs by right to the lamb who was slain. So there's another clue there that this scroll uh, is a list of all of God's saved people. If we put the evidence together, what do we have here then? Well, we, we have the scroll of destiny. We have the scroll of God's will for the last movement of human history. This is the missing script. We actors have lost all our copies, but fortunately the director still has his, his original, and he's holding on to it. It also includes a full cast list, you'll be pleased to know. This is God's plan for history, his plan to judge, his plan to redeem. It's all there, with no detail missing. But here's the extraordinary thing. As John looks, it is still a secret an unfulfilled plan, sealed with seven seals, like a will which has not yet found the sole executor who has the authority to open it and read it. And even more extraordinary, nobody can break those seven seals. What an extraordinary suggestion. Here are the eternal decrees of God and they cannot be carried out. Here are the names of God's elect, and they cannot be called out. Here is the final judgment of God, and it cannot be passed out. What John shows us here is a universe, the future of which is hanging in the balance in some extraordinary way. You know... Um, Going back to my dramatic ambitions, one of these days I want to write a, a science fiction story that will be televised, sort of something like Star Wars, only even better, you know? I've got the climax of the plot worked out. Should I, should I tell you? Well, it's like this. I want you to imagine for a moment you're in the headquarters of, uh, of NASA in the USA. You know where they do all this, the space shuttle flights from? Around you are all those dozens of vast computers, manned by the most brilliant scientists available. And there's the space shuttle, about to be launched on its most vital mission ever. The survival of the entire human race hinges on this successful completion of this expedition. But an evil extraterrestrial empire is plotting to take over the world. And only a preemptive strike against it can avert total disaster. The crucial counter, countdown has, has commenced. The shuttle is about to be launched upon this dramatic mission to save the world and to defeat the extra, extraterrestrial power. A huge digital clock overhead indicates the last few seconds before liftoff. Ten, 
nine, eight. And then suddenly at number seven, the figures freeze. All over the control center, hands are raised in frenzied panic as the, as the entire launch sequence is arrested in mid-count. Seven seconds left and something's gone wrong. There's been a technical hitch. A top secret launch code has to be tapped into this computer bank before the countdown can proceed and only one person knows it. A heroic young space pilot. He has penetrated enemy high command and discovered the necessary coordinates. But he's nowhere to be found. The president in the White House has his eyes glued to his television monitor and his ear to his red telephone, but he can't do anything about it. The engineers on the ground and the security men surrounding the launch pad and the technical staff at Mission Control, they are all shrugging their shoulders in helplessness. Some are even beginning to weep. He must be found. The future depends upon him. You know? Not bad, is it? Quite a dramatic moment, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well worth Luke Skywalker's time, I think. Well, that's the picture here, you see. Like a great space shuttle standing on the launch pad, God has a plan of salvation, poised for execution, waiting for someone to, to tap in that secret code and release it on its journey, to launch it upon its mission. But, but who? Who can do it? Who can set in motion the wheels of the last phase of human history? It's not strength that's required, or one of these mighty angels could do it. God is looking for some very special kind of virtue here. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? That's the question they're asking. The challenge is going out to men and to angels, but, but nobody responds. Nobody dares even to claim the tiniest right to a peep at those secret pages. It's as if act one of the drama has come to an end. And in the interval before the, the curtain goes up on act two, the leading man has got lost. The play just can't go on without him. Verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. What are those tears? These are the tears of our world's agony. We feel instinctively that there is a purpose to our being here, don't we? All of us feel that. We speak of progress because deep down inside of our human nature there is this sense of some noble and glorious destiny that we human beings were meant for. And yet we are congenitally incapable of achieving that destiny. It remains a tantalizing mirage, haunts our dreams, sometimes inspires fanaticism like that of National Socialism in the 1930s, but it always eludes our grasp. These are the tears of mankind's lost inheritance. These are the tears of our forfeited destiny. These are the tears of mankind weeping for paradise lost. John, John's tears here echo the heartache of countless millions of human beings who find themselves frustrated by the apparent invincibility of evil. Utopia never comes. We dream about it, but it never comes. Can God's good eternal purpose really be thwarted by the power of evil in our world? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? Could we Christians have backed the wrong side? 
Could it be the witches will inherit bliss and St. Francis the Inferno? As John looks, even the angels of heaven seem to be asking that same question. Who can open the scroll? Because till it's answered, the drama of history remains locked in this gap. The universe holds its breath in suspense. And the human race must weep. And no, there is a sign of hope. Verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Well, of course. We knew it all along, didn't we? The Messiah, the one predicted by the prophets, the son of David. He's the leading man we're waiting for. He's the one who the Bible says will trigger this final flow of world history and bring in the kingdom of God. He's the one who will complete the plan of redemption. If anybody can do it, he can. But where is he? Look for a lion, chaps. The lion of Judah. That's what they call him. Look for a lion. But as John turns, you will notice it isn't a lion that he sees. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. In all John's symbolism in this whole book, I don't think there's a greater master stroke than this, you know. It would take a whole book, really, to capture the poignant contrasts that John has, has encapsulated in this single stroke of visual picture, visual metaphor. Here is a lamb, you see, a beast of weakness, a, a beast of harmlessness, a beast of innocence, most of all, a beast of sacrifice. A lamb as it had been slain. And yet you notice this lamb is not lying prostrate on the butcher's slab. No, this lamb is standing regnant. He has horns of power and rule. This is no mild and dreamy bar lamb who has wandered from the flock then. Though he bears the mark of recent suffering, they are the wounds of war he bears. For this is the conquering lamb, John sees. He has actually, I think, fused the Passover lamb picture from the Old Testament with the he-goat picture that is often common in apocalyptic books like, uh, like Daniel as a symbol of power and dominion. He's pulled these things together with a kind of prophetic genius to demonstrate to us the paradoxical economy of God that victory and triumph has come out of suffering. That the ultimate purpose of God has not been achieved by a lion, but by a lamb. There are two things in closing that I want you to learn from this remarkable scene. The first is this. I want you to learn from this passage the pivotal significance of the cross in history. What do they say in verse 9? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. Not then because of the glorious person he is by nature as God's son. Not because of the decisive role he played in creation as the word of God but because of what he has accomplished in time and history as the Lamb of God, that is what qualifies him to be the one who opens the scroll of life and of judgment. 
not as the author of the play, but as the hero of the play, does he come at this point in, in Revelation 5 to take the script from the director's hand and execute it. Now, this is a fascinating insight, you know. One of the great problems of understanding the Bible's view of history is to do justice to two apparently contradictory elements which the Bible always puts together. See, on the one hand, the Bible insists that history is determined, that God's will shall be done. The Bible says everything is planned in advance, everything will work out in accordance with his will and decree. And yet though the Bible says that, it also says on the other hand that history matters. Uh, that it's not a game that God plays for his own amusement. The Bible says history is serious, history is necessary. What happens here in this world of time that God has created is crucial. Now how can both of those be true? If God knows what he wants as the end result, why doesn't he just go straight to it? Haven't you ever asked yourself that? Why does God bother with this charade called history anywhere? If he knows where we're going, why does he just do it? It can't make any difference in the last analysis, can it? Not to somebody as sovereign and as great as he is. Well, John is providing us here with a very vital clue to that dilemma. In fact, it's, it's the reason, you know, that Christianity is, in my view, so fundamentally superior to Islam, even though we share the same high view of God's sovereignty. Yes, the script is written down. God has chosen his elect and planned the final act of history and how it will be wound up, but that script is sealed. And those seals can only be broken, this is it, on the basis of something which Jesus achieved within history. Isn't that extraordinary? The fulfillment of God's purpose in history is contingent on something. It's contingent upon the cross, upon that decisive event. The outcome of this drama was not a foregone conclusion, at least not as far as the actors or the audience were concerned. The director was keeping us in suspense until his hero made his entrance. The angel had to go on asking the question, who is worthy, and it had no answer, till he came. It is only now, in the aftermath of the cross, that heaven is able to say, you are worthy, because you were slain. Now, I can't stress to you the importance of this enough. The world, and I'm afraid some Christians sometimes, seem to me to see Calvary as just a kind of wonderful example of human love and self-sacrifice. I've heard many people explain the cross to me in those kinds of terms, which of course it was. But it is so much bigger than that. No, heaven sees the cross as the pivotal turning point of history. The blood that was shed there was not a mere illustration of God's eternal willingness to forgive us. The blood that was shed there was absolutely necessary to enable God to forgive us. That, that blood was, was absolutely essential. Without it... The international community of the redeemed, this number from every nation and tribe and language and people, would have been forever a lost multitude. God's purpose of grace, his plan to build a kingdom, it would have been permanently frustrated. Only because the lamb was slain can the seals on this book of life be opened. That's the pivotal significance of the cross in history. No more important event has ever occurred. Monday, lots of people will be celebrating VE Day. 
looking back to a great victory. And I think with a certain amount of legitimate gratitude. For fascism did represent a most appalling and demonic evil. And my German friends are the first to admit it to me. But we Christians know of a day in history that is as far above VE Day in its significance as the heavens are above the earth. The cross is the pivotal event in the history not just of Europe, the history of the entire human race, the history of the universe. There is not a person on this earth, not a human being who has ever lived, who can afford to be in ignorance of that event. It is that crucial. For that event has changed human history. Indeed, it has done more than changed history. It has changed heaven. It has changed the unchangeable. Don't you see? They sing a new song in heaven since the good news of the ascended Christ reached their ears. What an extraordinary thought. But brave John is intrepid enough to make it. That's the first thing I want you to take home with you then as we conclude. The pivotal significance of the cross in history. Never, never, never get tired of thinking about the cross, trying to understand the cross, and of thanking God for the cross. But the second thing I want you to learn from this passage is this. The unique position of Jesus. Just notice where he is in chapter 5. Is he around the throne with the elders and the living creatures? No, no. The lamb is on the throne. And he's not perched uncertainly on the edge of it either, is he? He's at the center of the throne. John stresses that. More even than where he is. Notice this chorus of adoration which he shares from the, from the beasts and the elders, from this huge multitude of the heavenly host in verses 7 and 8 and verse 11. Scarcely has heaven finished its eulogy than the whole of creation, the whole of the heavens and the earth pick it up in verse 13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Not in the whole of the Bible will you find a more, a more triumphant scene of, of splendid and gripping worship. They say that Handel's Messiah was composed uh, as a result of reading this passage, you know. And maybe that's the real way to hear it. Maybe you need to, you need to get a recording of uh, Handel's Messiah, take it out on your uh, pocket super woofer, onto the, onto the, onto the hills, out, on, out, out on, on, the, on the hills of west of here maybe, and uh, blow your ears out with quadraphonic sound a thousand watts down each speaker and read this passage. And maybe we shall get some glimmering kind of picture, some sense of the glorious exaltation John experienced as he heard this mind-blowing symphony of praise. But who is it offered to? It's offered to Jesus. Can anybody seriously doubt that John believed in the deity of Christ? when a chorus of adoration of this magnitude is offered to the Lamb. Why, if anything, the adoration of the Lamb surpasses the adoration of the Father. If heaven wonders at the sovereignty of God the Creator, it wonders even more at the triumph of God the Redeemer. And this is the Jesus. But we've come into this place to worship this evening. This is the Jesus to whom we give our lives in service. Maybe nobody's persecuting you. Maybe uh, it's hard for us to empathize fully with how these Christians in the book of, uh, that John is writing to in the book of Revelation were feeling, persecuted by the Roman 
authorities in danger of their lives. Of course, there are many of our brothers and sisters around the world who know that. Anybody who's going to become a Christian from a Muslim Uzbek background is going to have to face that. In fact, ever since Jesus ascended and went to glory, you could make a strong case for saying that it is persecution which is the norm for the church. And our kind of experience of safety and toleration, the anomaly, the rarity. But all right, maybe it is difficult for us to fully empathize with where these people were coming from. Maybe it is hard for us to feel how we would react if we knew when we went home tonight there could be a knock on the door and we could be dragged off as Jews and yes, some Christians were dragged off by the Nazis. But that doesn't mean we can't engage with what's going on here, does it? It doesn't mean that we can't feel the same excitement, feel the same thrill. It doesn't mean we can't empathize with what a wonderful thing it is that Jesus is this glorious and this victorious. And isn't it true to say that people who feel that way about Jesus, who understand Jesus that way, are going to have people with great energy and boldness to serve him and witness for him? Isn't that true? Shouldn't it be true of us? Do we need anything more than these two chapters to give us the courage to speak to that person next door? To get involved in that Christian service here in the city? Do we need anything more to motivate us than this? Shame on us if we do. Take a peep behind the curtains. Take a look behind the door. See the director's chair. See the missing script. But most of all, take a look at that leading man. Let's pray quietly together for a few moments and then Jeff will lead us in a closing song. You turn with me to number 75 in our books as we uh, together share the privilege of joining in the praise of heaven. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. I don't think we need any more fuel for our worship, do we, than what we've heard and what we've looked at tonight. Let's stand and let's worship him. 75.
just pray together. Father, we thank you for focusing our eye on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Lord, sometimes in the world that we live in, our gaze is deviated away from him to other things. Lord, we pray that we may go away from this place just rejoicing in our hearts in Jesus, in the cross, and what he's done for us. We thank you, Father, that at the center of all things, the center of the universe, there is the cross. And Lord, we just rejoice in what we've heard tonight. Lord, we thank you for being here with us. And we pray that as we end our evening together, as our hearts have been raised in praise and rejoicing and worship to you, so Lord, you will hear our prayer and that you'll go before us. And in these coming days, Lord, as we sit under your ministry, and Lord, that our hearts may continue to be thrilled and that you will continue to be glorified. So bless us, Father. We say the grace and we'll say it to each other. If you feel comfortable with keeping your eyes closed, feel, do that. feel free to do that. Let's say the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord has been with us in a special way tonight, and we're so grateful to his servant, our brother, uh, for bringing the word to us, and we are looking forward to what he has to say tomorrow and the next day, and I do hope you're going to be with us and uh, you plan to come. If you hadn't been planning to come, please now change your minds, and please bring others too. We want others just to come and sit under this ministry, a ministry that we need to hear in these days. So please do be here. And if you lead anything at all, Sunday school, class, or whatever, try to come in the morning. Now, I know some of you work. The world has to roll on. But we pray that you'll be with us at 9.30 or 10 in the morning for Philip Hacking. We're going to have a great morning together. Let me just say that there is literature available from our missionary friend here tonight. And uh, that's at the back if you want to talk to him. He has a little stand just over there at the back of the hall. Or the tapes are available this side. So don't forget those or the bookstore. And also remember, there's coffee available downstairs, and uh, we trust that you're going to have some fellowship with us. Thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and indeed more as well. So God bless you, and thank you for being here. May the Lord be with you as you travel away. Amen.